Welcome to Try Babies, the podcast where we're not afraid to be seen trying and crying. You're joined by Sunroom co-founders Michelle Battersby, that's me, and Lucy Mort. That's me. We help build the world's largest dating apps, Bumble and Hinge. Now we're in the thick of building our own tech company and we're bringing you along for the wild ride. Each week you'll hear from us as we fill you in on the good, the bad and the ugly when it comes to business, career, relationships and everything in between. We'll tackle burning audience questions and be joined by inspiring creators, female business leaders and the people who have motivated and energised us along the way. These won't be your typical shiny business stories. We want to showcase the experiences that go unsaid and definitely chat about the moments that don't make it onto Instagram. Prepare to hear about the lows, the failures, the doubt and the downright nightmare days. Navigating life through your 20s and 30s can be hard, which is why we're so passionate about creating a space for you to come to on the days you need to feel seen, inspired, educated, supported, and sometimes shocked into action. This is honestly the podcast we both needed throughout our journeys. On today's episode, we hear more about Michelle's journey, from competitive rowing as a teen to stumbling across a banking HR job to Bumble, Kick, and leaving it all behind to start Sunroom. For anyone who is a little bit lost in their journey, this is a must listen. Well, so excited to be back for our third installment of Try Babies. Uh, and this one, I think, is a very special one because we're interviewing Michelle and we're getting to know Michelle's background, her career, all of the choices and stories that led her to be here in this seat with us. I'm nervous because you know me, so I'm disarmed. <laughs> I'm immediately disarmed, the guards down. So who knows what could come out of my mouth? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, okay, so I feel like let's start at the beginning. Like where and how and when did you come into the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born on the 3rd of April, 1991. Fun fact, Lucy was born on the 4th of April. So maybe where, you know, was separated at birth. <laughs> um, grew up, born in Sydney, lived in Manly on Sydney's northern beaches. So... Pretty normal upbringing, I think. Very outdoorsy, very active. I'm the eldest of three girls. Do you consider yourself like a surfy chick or is there any sort of surfer identity? Absolutely not. I'm actually terrified of waves. One of my biggest fears. I did do nippers, which I think any kid who grew up on the beaches, especially Sydney's Northern Beaches, did nippers, but I actually refused to ever do the water activities. So I only ever did the sprint and flags, uh, and I, I I never really stepped foot in the water, and even to this day I do not go out past the break of the waves. Wow. Yeah, it's very hard to get me out there. Uh, <laughs> and, like, what, what was your upbringing like? Like your time with your sisters, relationship with your sisters? My sisters and I are very close. I feel like we've probably become more like best friends as we've got older. We definitely had fights growing up, like – Madeline and Lani both had locks on their bedroom doors. I never got a lock because I was apparently the problem, um, even though I would say they stole my clothes just as regularly as I stole theirs. But my childhood was really just all about sport. Like sport was my favourite thing, competing, racing with my sisters, our family would go down to the beach and my dad would actually set up like handicap beach sprints that my mum and him also had to participate in. And oh I think God. he'd always try to stitch my mum up so that like maybe I would beat her each time. <laughs> Wait, so how did you get into sport? Like, yeah, how did this come to be? So <clears throat> my parents were both really good athletes. So my dad was an Olympian and my mum was a world champion, both in rowing. And I just thought that was so cool growing up, like having an Olympic medal in the house and just knowing that they excelled in sport. And I, I also just naturally gravitated towards sport. I just loved it. I was, I was an athletic kid, so I was good at it. I liked that feeling. Um, but I definitely also felt like probably from the age where I could understand that it was pretty cool to have like got to the Olympics and got a medal, I definitely felt this pressure to be as great as that. Like, okay, if they could both do this, uh, I should be able to do this as well. I should be able to get pretty good at a, a sport of my choice. <laughs> 
And so I just became obsessed with being, trying to be the best at most sports I did. Wow. Yeah. So at, at age, let's say 12, what was your sport of choice? What was your, your top pick? So 12 was probably the age where I started rowing. So I actually used to go down to the rowing shed with my dad when I was eight or nine and I used to cox. You know, he can sit in the seat and steer the boat. Yeah, I would go out as a kid and and cox from, from the age I could make sure they I wasn't steering them into the bank, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, and I'd always wanted to try rowing, but you couldn't really start it until year seven. Before that, it was all athletics, like high jump, loved high jump, um, loved hurdles, loved running. Yeah, just any kind of cross country, anything. And then high school was when I started to get into rowing. And it definitely, this sounds so wanky, but it, it did kind of come naturally, technically, I suppose. And I was good at it. And so I just thought, you know, genetically I should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about high school. Like where did you go to high school? What was that experience like? So I went to, I went to a lo local public school up until year six. And then I went to an all girls school, Queenwood. I went there from years seven to 10. I, I loved it. Um, but I actually ended up moving schools in year 11 for year 11 and 12, which was quite a big shock. I had really good friends at Queenwood, enjoyed the school. It actually was because of rowing. It's kind of a weird story. Um, the coaches <laughs> kind of hated my parents and that they were good at rowing. My parents weren't overbearing. They never pressured me to do anything. They, they're not those kind of like super hands-on trying to tell someone how to do their job. I think they just had a bit of a disdain for my dad from somewhere. And so they weirdly started taking it out on my sister and I and they would make us do extra stuff at training. We both started getting injuries. Um, they would play these weird mind games like we would go out and do time trial races to see if you were going to get in the best boat and I would win. Um, and they would tell me that then someone else had actually beat my score or there was something wrong with their boat so I needed to go and do mine again. And I'd be like, okay, and I'd just go and do it again and I'd have to win again. Um, yeah, it was really, really weird. I actually don't think I remember the full extent of it, but I do remember one training session where, um, there's these hectic stairs in Seaforth called the Gallipoli stairs. And, um, I had to run up them 14 times and run like back around the block and go again. And I remember coming home, I'd torn my lats cause I actually started crawling up them. And I told my dad and he was like, we used to train those for the Olympics and like the most I've ever gone up them is like six or seven times. Oh my <laughs> but God. But I was 14. Yeah, 14 doing 14 sounds weird, but yeah. And um, so my parents made a complaint to the school and they just didn't really care. And they fired a couple of coaches that also brought it up and my parents were like, we are pulling them out of this school. So I literally was at Queenwood on a Tuesday and on a Wednesday I was at Pimble. I knew no one. It was so far away from my house. No one had ever heard of the suburb I was from. Had to catch two buses and a train. Um, but we basically got moved to this school because it was the best at rowing. And we didn't really get a choice. <laughs> um, but th that was probably kind of a weird thing to go through. But I had rowing. I was good at rowing. And now I was at this school that was the best at rowing. And so I actually thought maybe I could get a scholarship to an American university. And I just focused on that. Wow. I mean, that's a really intense experience to go through as what, like a 16 year old or something. But yeah, I, was, I think I was 14, 14 or 15. Oh yeah. But, but talk about prep for like resiliency in your life and mm. I don't know, stamina in your life. I, I'm kind of curious about like you are a very competitive person. <laughs> it's what makes you an amazing business partner. Or it's what makes you like uh, excel in your career. Um, did that come from sport or was that like something else that was like deeper and more innate in you? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I've always had, like I've always had this thing in me where I just like have to prove it to myself that I'm really, can be really good at something. I think the competitiveness definitely stems from, from all the sport that I did. I genuinely love the feeling of winning. I, I love that feeling. I just think there's no better feeling, but I love the feeling of doing it in a team. Like all the sports I did 
were mainly team sports, being in an eight and you're all literally going through hell. It is so painful. Like rowing is not a fun sport. But then you get through this, you know, seven minutes of hell and you've won and you've done it by each going as hard as the person next to you. It's just an amazing feeling. I think sport is what I channeled like all of my competitive energy into growing up. And then once I realized that I wasn't going to be as good as I'd hoped, I just transitioned all of that competitiveness into career. And when did you make that realization? So when I was about 22, I ended up going um, like going to Sydney Uni and rowing there and it became much harder for me when it was starting to, to get into the territory of how do you make Australian teams because rowing has weight divisions, heavyweight and lightweight, and I was the lightest heavyweight rower kind of in, in Australia, I guess. Um, and so they told me I should go lightweight, which you have to hold your weight at 59. So I got put on a diet and I had to report my weight every Monday and I could get down to 59. But once you made the Australian team, you had to prove you could get to 57. And I was just never going to be able to get to 57. So I just quit because I'm like, I don't even find this sport that fun. I'm only doing it to win. And now I've got to starve myself. (laughs) This isn't for me. (laughs) Um, so I, I would have been 21 or 22, and that's when I got a bit more serious about, well, what's my passion? I need, I need a passion because now I've lost my, my passion, I suppose. Even though I didn't love it, I was passionate about winning and I was passionate about the team. Yeah. So I had to find something else. So how, like, what did that exploration look like? Or what did that phase of your life look like? It was heavily guided. Again, just everything early in my life is kind of my parents' guidance. I think my dad could tell I was pretty lost And it was like this thing I'd really focused on was now no longer going to be a focus for me. So he actually suggested HR. I'd done an undergrad degree in arts, super broad, still didn't know what I wanted to do. But he told me about HR, how the HR department worked at his company and got me to come in on like a semester break to do work experience at his company. And he also told me they work with people and they get paid really well. (laughs) So I was like, perfect. (laughs) So I went in, did the work experience, liked it, and then I enrolled in a master's in HR and industrial relations. And again, the competitiveness, I knew it was seen as being kind of elite if you could get into a grad or internship program at an investment bank. So I just started focusing on how I was going to do going to do that. But I wasn't very smart. So I had to do everything in like an unconventional way. I only got into uni because... I got extra points in the HSE because of rowing. That's the only way I got into my degree. And I didn't actually get into a traditional internship program at an investment bank. I went through this little side door Sydney Uni thing that they had called the industry placement program where they actually just matched people with companies based on their personality and it was really under-adopted and no one really knew about this program. So I did it and that's how I got an internship at a bank. I honestly think that's a... (laughs) Of maybe an under underappreciated talent, your ability to like find back doors and like side doors and like, yeah, work your way through life into success that way. Um, so yeah. So what was it like working in in HR? I loved it at first, and I felt like young Michelle was cheering inside. I can remember rocking up to Park Street in the city, wearing my fancy little corporate outfit. There's the glass revolving doors, and I'm thinking to myself, I've fucking made it. <laughs> this is it. Um, and it was just, yeah, I, I loved it. I felt like I got to work with really smart people that I hadn't really been around those kinds of brains before but they were different kind of thinkers to me and I felt like they really appreciated HR and I got to HR is a great profession if you're nosy you get to know so much juicy secret information Uh, but it was also just incredible exposure to work at these huge like conglomerates these companies kind of controlling the world almost to see what their processes and policies were right and to see what happens if you don't treat people well uh, and if you say the wrong thing um, and also how to behave as an employee like it's it's a very good first experience I think but I did it for about four or five years and 
I suppose that excitement of getting into it wore off and then I realised I don't think I can do this for the rest of my life. I'm not really passionate about this. And also I was making people redundant and investigating, you know, grievances, behavioural issues. It was a little bit, it actually like weighed on you uh, quite a bit, but it also was an amazing lesson in uh, separating business from personal. You really had to be able to detach yourself from what you were doing and just focus on the facts. Wow. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. So you are the kind of person who is like very yourself at work, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, which is amazing. Um, but I'm trying to imagine you in the context of like a, a bank working in HR. Did you, were you super buttoned up? Like yeah. what was, okay. Yeah, I think I was very different. I had a couple of friends where we would be ourselves as soon as we walked out the door, but I was very much playing a role and and trying to be very professional and I was very careful about the things that I said because any wrong slip in a meeting if you're HR that person could sue the whole company because of you if you've made someone feel like I remember one time I I had a meeting with someone and uh it was it was probably one of my first weeks and I was just shadowing and so the actual HR manager was out of the room and this person came in And they said something about them being scared. And I said, "Uh, don't worry, it'll be okay. And as soon as those words left my mouth, I was like, oh my God, I don't, I don't actually know if it will be okay. And I should not have just said that to them. And yeah, so you just, there's not much room for error. (laughs) Oh, that's so tough. It wasn't okay for them. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) Yeah. Oops. Oh, okay. So it it sounded like you were thinking about whether or not this was going to be like the right path for you. So what was that next level of exploration and like consideration? It's so weird because I, I was starting to just think about things I could do. Like I remember I phoned a friend who was a PT and I started looking into becoming a PT. I wrote this program called the three by three. I was sending it to all my friends because I'd always been into, I guess, training. Uh, And I started to just think about what my other options could be. And even though that was at a very early stage, those conversations just ended up changing my life because I started speaking to friends about how I wasn't sure what I was going to do and I was looking for other options and I spoke to a friend I'd been to school with who remembered that conversation a few months later and hit me up and said, are you still not liking your job? I've just met this woman. She co-founded Tinder. She is starting her own app called Bumble. Read this article she basically said, if I were you, um, I'd do this, but I'm I'm not going to because I'm going to stay in London. And I'd never used a dating app and Tinder had a really bad reputation at the time because there had just been that Tinder balcony death. Um, and so I just didn't know if this was an area that I really wanted to get into. And I didn't know who Whitney was. And yeah, I'd, I'd never heard of Bumble. I don't know if I mentioned that. And so I actually ignored her a little bit. Uh, shouted me on Facebook, (laughs) sent me a couple of messages and I just, I pushed it to the side of my brain and then I was at work one day and she emailed me and she was actually in LA at the time and said, I'm free right now if you can chat. And there was just a meeting room open across the hall and so I scurried on into it and I can play, I can like see the whole conversation in my head still. I can remember what I was looking at, where I was and the things that she said And I just believed her. She just spoke to me about this culture that she was trying to create at Bumble. She already had the idea for Bumble BFF and Bumble Biz. She was pitching it to me that it was going to be the social network for people you don't know was her line. You've already got Facebook for all the people that you do know. Where do you go for the people that you don't know? And we spoke a lot about the just gender dynamics in general, and I'd been working at these investment banks, like very masculine energy, but I'd been working on teams with all women. So I was just experiencing, you know, weird things myself. She spoke a lot about women supporting women, which I think we've heard to death these days, but back in 2016, it wasn't something I'd really heard about. And I can remember just getting goosebumps over my whole body. And I had this voice inside my head 
that literally said to me, this is going to be the biggest thing you ever do. This is going to change your life. And I told her I'd think about it. (laughs) I remember she gave me a salary as well and I was like, well, I'm actually paid this and asked for like more just straight up. Um, Anyway, I remember I told her I'd think about it. I called my dad and he was like, quit your job. Uh, And just said, like, you should definitely do this. And so I messaged her back and was like, "Um, yeah, I've thought about it. I'll do it. And I think I quit my job that day or the next day. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) And what was the role specifically? Like, what was her ask? To launch Bumble in Australia. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) And there were six employees at Bumble at the time. So I was employee, like, six or seven. I don't remember the full number. It was very early. There were four main women in LA and someone in the UK and, yeah, she just wanted me to launch it into the market, do marketing events. I think maybe one of the things that made her like me was when I had worked at Citibank, I also ran the graduate program. So I would go out to all the universities, I would go to the careers fairs, I would pitch City to all these like brilliant grads and I would try to get them to choose City and I would like run all the interview processes and kind of do a lot of coordinating and things like that. So I think that appealed to her. Um, yeah, but it it got harder because then I was working out my one month notice period and I think Bumble US worked out that it actually costs quite a bit of money to employ people in Australia because we have such good employee benefits like annual leave and all those sorts of things. And so the offer changed a little bit and it was that I had to start my own company and if I could prove Bumble could work in the Australian market, then they would create an entity and that's when I started to get scared because that felt like a much bigger risk. I didn't know anything about even like getting an ABN or starting a proper company and getting insurance and what would that mean for the people that I was then going to bring on and yeah it just changed it a little bit uh but I yeah just still went through with it because I didn't really have anything to lose in the long term <laughs> <laughs> seemed like there it seems like the right decision um and this was your first like proper marketing gig right so like you might not have even known the questions like did you know that you had a budget did you know that you had resources oh, in I order didn't to ask. Just, okay <laughs> yeah I had no idea what was going to happen next. Uh, Absolutely no idea. And I'd never even been to like a fancy event or, or anything. I knew nothing about PR. I can remember my first task was to find a PR agency and I organized all these meetings and then I kind of reported back to Whitney and the team and I remember someone saying to me, can you send the creds? And I was like, what is creds? What does that mean? And so I called a friend who works in PR. I was like, what are creds? She was like, credentials. Like, we'll just send you a a deck of what we're about. I just, I had no clue. (laughs) I didn't even know the basics. (laughs) So, like, how, I mean, what a gargantuan task to launch Bumble in Australia. But, like, how did you get users in the beginning? So what I've come to really appreciate now a few years later is just how lucky I was to be given the the handbook by the American team. Like they had already been, they'd already spent two years trying and testing and experimenting in their own market, working out what was going to stick. And I just got handed the rule book and all I really needed to do was replicate it and apply it to an Australian audience. And so I think all you really needed to know as the person responsible for that is, you know, where are the unis you should be hitting up? Where do people go out after uni? Where is everyone exercising? Where's everyone partying? What's everyone wearing? What are the most followed cult brands at the moment? And kind of blend that into this recipe. So it started with a string of parties and it was really about bringing everyday influential people together. But when I say influential, I mean big fish, little pond. So you kind of needed to know who the, who the cool girls were. 
Who were the most influential people on the northern beaches? Who were the most influential people on the North Shore? Who was it in the eastern suburbs? And I didn't know those people, but I knew people who would know those people and could kind of bring them together. And it was easy to get them to come to events because they weren't influencers, they weren't celebrities, they were everyday big fish, little pond. So you invite them to this baller party and they're like, fuck yeah. And I get to bring 20 of my friends and I get free stuff and I can splatter it all over Graham. And it just immediately made Bumble appear bigger than it was. And like it was being used by these cool people. So you wanted to use it too. So it was very grassroots. It was very grassroots. It was very scrappy. Um, and it was about, yeah, influential big fish, little pond brand partnerships, and then starting to get more into ambassadors once I guess the presence was a little bit more established. What were, um, some of the other like scrappy tactics that you guys used on the ground? Oh, it was just so like cheap and cheerful at the start, to be honest. Like we would pick, we, we started working with Bumble Honeys. So we went round to all the major universities. We found women that were living on campus who were looking for work experience. We would give them a list of tasks. They would fill us in on where everyone was going on campus. They were paid for completing certain tasks. They would do like pre-drinks, coffee pop-ups. Sometimes we'd just pay for people's coffee at certain universities, putting stickers on all the lecture doors, chalking pavements. I don't even know if that's legal, but we were doing it. A lot of vandalism, (laughs) Uh, going to all the major beaches and just putting like fake parking fines on people's cars. Just to start, it's almost like you just wanted wherever the people that you wanted on the platform were, you just wanted to get Bumble in front of their face in some kind of way. And that could be as simple as chalking a pavement writing in lipstick in the in the clubs you know everyone's going to download Bumble on the mirror, putting it on their lecture doors, asking a cafe if you can put Bumble stickers on all the cups that day if you just give them a grand, that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. So now at this point uh, in your career, events are like – some in some ways your bread and butter like you I know you love doing events and you can pull off like a killer event back then I'm assuming like you hadn't done many no. or any before <laughs> yeah. um are there any event mishaps oh that yeah have- <laughs> the very first bumble event <laughs> the logo was upside down <laughs> and I remember sending all the photos to Whitney and they're all like this looks amazing But that just shows like those things didn't matter. Like it wasn't about perfection. It was like about being good, Mm. you know, get the right people in there. Who cares if there's a couple of little mishaps? The fact that the logo was upside down and not one person told me, like I worked this out a couple of years later when I was looking back at photos and I'm thinking, holy fuck, (laughs) the logo's upside down and I didn't even know you needed to get it above head height. So everyone's head is also chopping off the words bumble. So sometimes it just looks like bum (laughs) and it was just not it. But I've also had like bigger ones where – Mm. maybe more Melbourne Cup, which would be definitely the most elite thing we ended up doing or the most prestigious thing at the time, Uh, torrential downpour. I had made a decision to cut gigantic holes in the walls because I was really obsessed with lighting at events. And I went in there a few days before, started taking selfies and was just thinking this will not do. The light isn't natural enough. So I made the construction team make the windows bigger. Didn't think about the fact that in Melbourne it's, you know, the classic four seasons in a day. Torrential downpour. Uh, we had to get like plastic sheets to cover these giant holes and then our marquee started flooding. So we drilled a hole through the bottom of the marquee and just put a couch, just repositioned the couch. And so it was just draining throughout the day because of this window. Yeah. Oh, my God. <clears throat> so Bumble HQ was based in Austin, Texas, and you were in Sydney. What was the dynamic like being so far away from mm. where the business was being run? We were definitely pretty isolated and honestly just like left to our own devices. (laughs) Uh, 
So we had a lot of autonomy and a lot of trust, which was amazing. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why we could just go so fast because we didn't even really need to get approval for anything. We just got given a budget. I would come up with a plan. I would send like dot points of what we were going to do for the quarter. There was an opportunity to question me on it at that point. If it wasn't questioned, that's what was happening. Uh, and so we could just just go with it. Sometimes there were global campaigns, but rarely would they force you to adopt it within your market. Whitney was always very much like, you grew up here, you know this better than I do, you make the decisions. I don't know what it's like to live in this country, so I'm not going to tell you how to how it's done. That's incredible. Yeah. Did you have certain growth targets you were trying to meet yeah. for Australia? Okay. Yeah. We always had growth targets, uh, but uh, it just always grew. <laughs> it just worked. I don't really know. I, I, I don't know if it was was luck. Right place, right time. I think Bumble just really resonated with an Australian audience and I think it was just the perfect storm. Bumble collided with a moment in time in society when women wanted to reclaim their power, they were stepping into their own, make the first move was something that I feel most women could really see themselves in and they could see themselves in that product. And so we we really just had to keep showing up. And I also think it was a really big advantage, Whitney, putting a team in Australia because not many tech startups would pick a market as small as Australia to actually invest in and put a team on the ground. So we could get a lot of attention in the media and a lot of hype because there weren't many companies like ours existing and doing the things that we were doing. It's so true. Yeah. So a couple of years after your first impression of Whitney when she pitched you on joining, uh, what was it like really getting to know her and what was it like working with her? I I have nothing but respect for her. I think she is – she's incredibly inspiring. The way she could just get up in front of the whole company and have you wanting to, you know, stand on the chairs being like, yes, she could rally – uh, she was really, really intuitive. Her instincts were just very on. And I think one of her, probably like her biggest X factor was the people that she was able to recruit and bring onto the team. She definitely demanded results, you know, like tech startup, you have to grow aggressive growth targets all the time. And some markets didn't live on, you know. There were quite a few country leads hired at the same time I was and in some markets it didn't work. In France it was really hard to get Bumble going. Apparently a woman making the first move is seen as slutty is what the French team said and it's quite – it's just not something that really resonates as much with their culture. I don't know if that's the same now. This was 2016 but there were some markets that were slower to pick up and – it was, you know, kind of fire fast in those situations as it is in tech startups. But I felt so – it truly was like empowering and it really was be the CEO. She made definitely the country leads feel like they were the CEOs of these markets and those markets were theirs. And I think that's just what made you so motivated and so willing to work incredibly hard because – you felt like you were in control of it and you were rewarded by your actions. It honestly sounds like a perfect work environment. What an epic experience. And it was like just a crash course in getting a business going with no financial risk for me. Mm. Bumble also had insane budgets. Like that is worth not noting. You know, we weren't like Hinge where we were raising money and really having to like prove a lot before we could get another cash injection. Bumble had money from the start and that, absolutely helped us like yeah. money wasn't really an issue yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that but I'll just say it <laughs> <laughs> no I, th I think it is helpful like I remember uh being at Hinge and just looking at Bumble's marketing and the hive cafes and spaces you would roll out and like the huge billboards that you would put together and I was like 
holy shit. Oh, I, I didn't understand the budget that you guys had. I was just like, they're amazing marketers mm. and they like know how to grow. Mm. Yeah, we definitely could do the glam, really elevated stuff. But I guess it was always paired with this scrappiness as well. So maybe that was the X factor of Bumble and what really led to that just insane, you know, explosive growth. Yeah. So you obviously didn't stay at Bumble forever. Well, <laughs> nah. how, like, how did the journey end and like, how did you know it was ready mm. to end? Same as what you said the other day, I'd actually been thinking about leaving for about a year. So I started to get this idea in my mind that maybe I could do this for other companies. You know, I was starting to pay more attention to the tech scene. I wonder if other tech apps wanted to come and grow in Australia. I felt like I had this almost like the key to unlock like what agencies you work with, what events you need to show up with, what brand partners would be great, who the people are who can convert. I just felt like I had this, yeah, I guess, Bible of how you could launch a brand into the Australian market. So I started considering doing that. Like, would I start my own thing? Could I take Bumble as a client and then try to build up a bank like that? They knew I was considering leaving, so they gave me a promotion. And that's when I started launching Bumble in other countries around APAC. And that kept me occupied for a while because I felt like I'd just done it all in Australia and it was starting to get a bit repetitive. So I thought launching Bumble into other markets would keep me challenged, but it actually was just rinse and repeat. It's like the exact same thing, just with different people and different brands and different events. Um, so then I started to get bored of that. And not bored. I just wasn't challenged. And I knew I had to leave Bumble whilst I still loved it. Like it had just transformed my life and honestly my identity. So I never wanted to resent it. So I wanted to go out on a high. And so uh, I had worked with Steph and Laura from Keep It Cleaner whilst I was at Bumble. They had started chatting to me about coming on as the chief marketing officer of their app and they were speaking about launching a uh, kick into like the US and the UK. So I thought, hmm, that's appealing. I can almost do what I did at Bumble, but in reverse and try mm -hmm. and do it in these other markets that I was never going to get exposure to whilst at Bumble. So yeah, I ended up resigning. I worked at Bumble for another five months, just kind of closed some things out. And then I moved from Sydney to Melbourne to work at Keep It Cleaner. Wow. Did you have any time off? It was just like... Straight, no time straight to the next. No time off, actually. And I do regret that because I just finished Melbourne Cup. So I came off the biggest high, honestly, of my life. Because having a marquee in the birdcage and doing something like that, it is just so – all eyes are kind of on you and what you're doing and you're working with such incredible people and the team, you've all put so much into this moment and there's so much growth riding on that being this huge big thing and I thought that was such a great bang to go out with at Bumble and then I literally packed my car in Sydney. I drove to Melbourne that weekend and then I started at kick on the Monday and I crashed. <laughs> I came down. <laughs> Wait, yeah. So what was joining kick like? Like what, yeah, what was the, you know, the first couple of weeks like? I naively just underestimated what that transition would be like. I've always been a act now, think later type person. I don't really, if, if I feel it that this is the right time and this is the right thing to do, I'll just do it and I'll ask questions later. And so that's what I did. And I just, I just don't think I realized how I, I did know my identity was so wrapped up in Bumble and it was something that was starting to scare me a little bit. It was one of the reasons why I also wanted to move on. I just never wanted to be known as like the Bumble girl. I still had these ideas buried inside me around what I could do on my own. Uh, I knew there were a couple of things I wanted to kind of, a couple of notches I wanted to get under my belt in terms of what I had exposure to, but I just underestimated how hard it would be detaching myself from Bumble. And I think I got really, I, I, I definitely, towards the end of Kick, I was really down about the decisions that I'd made and I was really worried that I was never going to feel 
happier than how I had felt at Bumble and that Bumble was going to be the best thing I ever did and I was never going to be able to outdo it. And those thoughts really, really fucked me up. <laughs> To be honest. Oh, man. How were you navigating that? Was this – were you alone in this? Did you have help? Were you letting letting people in on this? I actually spoke to Whitney quite a bit through through all of that. Uh, and I spoke to mentors, spoke to my parents, and I also got a career coach because I also just didn't see myself going to kick. And, like, I had some amazing moments at kick, like – loved the people that I was working with, loved the campaigns. I tried to bury myself in projects and work that really ignited me to try and like pick myself back up. And I think COVID struck at the same time. So there were just all these things really um, getting me down. I did get a career coach and that's when I was starting to work through the acceptance that this probably wasn't going to be a role I could stay in for a long time because I wasn't happy and I was definitely having some comparison issues. Like I remember Whitney saying, and everyone says it now, but she was like, comparison is the thief of joy. Like you need to kind of like park everything you did at Bumble. Like it was so amazing, but like you will go on to do more and more. And she really encouraged me to start thinking about my own things whilst I just enjoyed the day to day. Wow. Yeah. And what what sort of things were you thinking about? <laughs> uh, so one of the things I started working on at Kick was uh, like transitioning them away from all their tech had been outsourced uh, and bringing it in-house. And I started to think, hmm, if I'm doing like helping them with this, I could be doing this for myself and do I want to keep working for others? Do I want to build other people's dreams or could I start to work on my own? And even in those first emails between you and I, I looked back through them and I actually said, I literally said, I'm thinking of starting a tech incubator for like women focused apps. I know how to grow apps. I don't know how to build them. I never could have done that. <laughs> like dream big, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I started thinking about that. Like, could I could I do something like that? I started going back to this. I know how to grow apps. Could I take on clients? Um, I started speaking to a mentor actually about like a mentoring networking type platform for women, a little bit bumble busy, but different and maybe a little bit more edgy to some of the existing like live events that that are in Australia. And it was when all those ideas started to come up that your email landed in my inbox. I mean, now that I know that timing, it's so fortuitous. And I, I, oh, honestly, I feel like at any time in my life where I have been really stuck, like I, I was in like a dark place trying to work out what my next move was going to be and if I could ever – outdo myself I just was so worried I would never feel like I could be greater than I was at Bumble and I was like how am I going to live with that I probably need to bring this up with my therapist like there's clearly <laughs> something wrong with me um but I just I started to really really worry about my life um and when I was in banking and 25 and I was looking around the room thinking I don't know what my passion is like why do people care more about this than me? I had this voice inside of me that was saying there's something else out there in the world that you are better at than this. But I had no fucking idea what that was. And then I get this intro to Whitney and then I'm literally in Melbourne down in the dumps wondering how can I keep growing? Like where can I go next? And your email lands in my inbox and it's like Whitney saved me, you saved me. And it's just like the universe just – has your back sometimes, but I don't know. I think it's a combination, the universe having your back of you accepting where you're at and accepting I need to make a change and now I'm going to start to put the wheels in motion. I'm going to start thinking. I'm going to start talking and that's when your eyes open up to the opportunities around you and that's when things just happen. But really it's a result of 
I think the inner work that you're doing. Yeah. And, and making yourself open. It's so interesting. Cause like, uh, my perspective, I didn't know you was just, <laughs> it was just totally different. So from the outside and I'd followed you on Instagram, I'd followed your career. Mm. I like saw all the press about you leaving Bumble and moving to kick and you don't, you'd been at kick for a year. So I was like, Oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to get this woman as a co-founder. So I actually went in uh, like asking you for intros yeah. to other people from Bumble because I was like, ah, oh, she's like too good. She's like got this amazing new gig. Like there's no way she would be interested in in this. Oh, I remember. <laughs> and I remember reading it and I was thinking, mm, do I intro her to people <laughs> or do I cock block this <laughs> and explore it for myself? But I think that's also one of the things I struggled with. Like I've never really shared this, like, how hard I was finding it to maybe reclaim my identity and work to a place where I felt happy and fulfilled again and accept that, you know, Bumble was amazing and it was now in the past. And yeah, I was struggling to come to terms with a lot of things. And I think just rushing into things probably didn't help and COVID probably didn't help. Uh, but I felt at the time I really had to make everything look much better or potentially easier for me than it was and I think I'm only really at a point where I can speak about this now because I do feel like now I'm I'm I've gone on to things that I'm really proud of and I you know it's like your career, career progression like isn't always going to be on the up sometimes it's going to feel like a sidestep sometimes it's going to feel like a backward step um, but I think your ego and your pride can really like take a hit in those times, which I would love to be better at managing because it's only now that I feel proud of the fact we've built a team, launched a product, raised money. I look at those things and I think, oh, yeah, I outdid I, I outdid it. Like I outdid what I did at Bumble finally. <laughs> we've come to the moment in our episode uh, where we have our little tradition around spicy questions. Uh and what I want to ask is, is there anything that happened uh, during your time at Bumble where at the time you were like sworn to secrecy, but with the, you know, the benefit of time, all these years that have passed, you, you could speak about now? Oh, God, I'm so loyal, Lucy. <laughs> Loyalty is one of my strongest traits. <laughs> Let me think. Oh, God, there's so many good stories. There's so many juicy ones. It's like what is actually not going to burn all my bridges I've worked so hard to maintain. <sighs> Let me think. And, and I, don't, I don't want you to burn any bridges, so. <clears throat> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think. Okay. And I don't think if there's anything that I could really share. I bet you like the, the couple of girls that worked with me the whole time, if they're listening to this, would be like, this one, this one. <laughs> I don't know. There's, it's like I would only tell those stories amongst, <laughs> amongst close friends because they're questionable. Mm, I don't mm, know if I can. That's okay. And the other ones I could tell they're just not that interesting. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one might, not, might also not be that interesting because uh, you've kind of already talked about it. But is, is there something specifically – in your career, maybe specifically or generally, um, that you classify as a regret? Like I regret that decision, I regret that move. Oh yeah. I don't I don't know if it's regret, but there are just some things that I would never do again. Definitely things I learned as a marketer. Like this might be useful because it's a lesson, but we paid one of the biggest names in Australia, $20,000 when I was at Bumble to do a post for us. So that just gives you an indication of the budgets as well. Uh, and they got, guess how many registrations they got off the back of this? 20 grand we pay them. <laughs> um, uh, like 5,000? 19. Oh my God. <laughs> 19 and that was a lesson in when you're working with creators or influencers like you shouldn't be working with a beauty influencer to promote a fitness brand and this was around Bumble Biz 
And it just indicated that that creator's audience actually weren't really, I guess, interested in the business side of things with them. They were probably interested in other things. Like, I, I don't know. But that's just something that I am now so conscious of. I feel like it's quite obvious, but sometimes you need to take a hit to learn that. But all of my like regrets and mistakes mainly are around money. Like I didn't realize at first we, oh, they'll know I'm talking about them. <laughs> oh, I got to stop that one. Uh, I need to make this a little bit more discreet. I didn't realize at first that if, because I'd never done PR, if you just have an amazing story and an amazing founder who's great at telling that story and the story resonates with the ma- a mainstream audience and what's going on in society, you're never going to have to pay for press. But I didn't realize that. So we spent so much money in one commercial partnership that resulted in absolutely fucking nothing and was such a flop. And that was probably in my first quarter working there. And then I realized, oh, my God, we never, we never, ever paid for press ever again. And I would never, ever pay for press. Like if you're having to pay for press, really, you should be working on your story and trying to like earn, you know, like earned media and make sure it's what journalists would actually be interested in reporting but I made a lot of like money mistakes that I wouldn't make again I think there are certain career moves at the time I would have looked at them and thought I regret this but now I look back on everything I've done and it is just it has all worked out perfectly like I got different exposure to different things at different places and it all led me to where I am now if I'd stayed at Bumble, I probably might have ended up presenting it. It might have started to change and I wouldn't have liked it. If I hadn't have gone to kick, I wouldn't have got like my hands on a team and been able to do different things to what I did at Bumble. And if I hadn't have felt, hadn't have been dealing with these inner struggles, I wouldn't have had my eyes open and been open to your email. Okay, fo- quick follow-up question <laughs> that's like uh, maybe a more personal spicy question related to money how are you personally in your personal life as like a money manager oh fucking terrible (laughs) (laughs) I am like I've worked so hard I'm gonna go blow the fucking bank (laughs) I deserve this I my dad would be he'd be so disappointed if he could take a look into my accounts he'd be like this is not the lessons I laid down (laughs) um I I'm not silly Like it's not like I'm in debt um, but I'm not a big saver. I'm – I mean look at both of us. We took ourselves off giant fucking salaries and paid ourselves minimum wage to do a a startup. I'm I'm down to take financial risks if I think it will pay off in in the end. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode. A quick ask if you enjoyed listening, it would mean the world if you could jump on Spotify or Apple and review the podcast. Five stars only, please. We need to build that army so we can read what you loved and what you want to hear more of. We're so grateful to have such an incredible community of empowered, motivated and confident women supporting each other here to go after their dreams. That's what we've needed most throughout our journey. You can subscribe so you don't miss our episodes or head over to our Try Babies podcast Facebook group and try babies insta where we can connect with you more and ask us questions that you want answered in the show see you on the next episode of try babies